Well, hello, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. I hope you are all having a great day. I hope you are all getting through all this um, with as much of a smile on your face as you can. And uh, wow, what a moment in history we're living through. Anyway, um, since Los Angeles, we basically can't really do much. We can go out and exercise. We can go out and do essential errands and things. I figured... I'm going to uh, incorporate my vlog into wherever I go walking to get my exercise for the day. So today we're going to talk about actually one of the um, murder locations and the actual apartment of one of the Hillside Stranglers. You see in 1977, Los Angeles lived in fear, primarily the younger women. Um, something unprecedented happened where um, women were being found um, murdered, left on hillsides, and all um, their demise was in the same way. Now, originally the police dubbed him the uh, Hillside Strangler, thinking that it was one person, but eventually as this would go on, they would realize that some of the locations weren't very plausible for one person to be able to leave a body, so that they realized that there were more than one, and it was actually cousins. It was... Um, Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buono and uh, Kenneth's story was that he was uh, born and raised in New York and his mother was actually a 17 year old alcoholic prostitute who gave him up for adoption almost immediately and he was said to have mental problems from the time he was a child he uh, was a compulsive liar they said that he had a disdain for women and throughout his life he would constantly try and get um, jobs in positions of power, primarily like police officers and sheriff departments, and was uh, always turned down and would eventually become um, a security guard and various things like that. But in 1975 he decided to move out to Los Angeles and that's where his story began. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. So in 1975, when Kenneth Bianchi moved to Los Angeles, he moved in with his cousin Angelo. And this was a time where it was kind of still free love and drug scene. And so they indulged in that. And Angelo was said to have had a um, criminal history of sexual abuse. So when a lot of these murders started to happen, those were some of the characteristics were that uh, all of these young women from the ages of 12 to 28, um, they did 10 in Los Angeles in total. Um, they were all sexually abused, and it said that they that none of them had um, suffered any trauma, which meant that they hadn't tried to resist it. And the reason that we would eventually find out that they weren't resisting is because these two men were posing as police officers and were gaining their trust or gaining their trust in the fact that they were arresting them so they didn't see anything like this coming and then they would perpetuate the murders. And eventually, um, word got out that that's what was happening and women were afraid to, you know, be pulled over by police officers. So Kenneth Bianchi was this compulsive liar who at one point even set up a psychology practice with a phony degree and was trying to bilk people out of their money that way and eventually got a job at the California title company here where he met his girlfriend, Kelly Boyd, who he would eventually have a child with in 1977. Actually, Kelly would become pregnant in June of 1977, have the baby at the end of February of 1978, and the murders would all take place by these two men from October of 1977 until February of 1978. Now once Kelly became pregnant, Kenneth proposed marriage, but because of his history of, you know, being a liar and throughout most of this time, he couldn't account for his evenings. He was going out with Angelo perpetuating these and couldn't account for his evenings and that really upset her. But they decided to get an apartment together and they got the apartment here in this building. In December, Kenneth had a call girl of 17 years old, much like the age of his mother, had her come here and killed her in the empty apartment. 
took her to a hillside in Echo Park and left her on the side and then moved his pregnant fiance or his pregnant girlfriend into this place. Now, until February when she would have the baby, they would perpetuate these 10 murders in the Los Angeles area. And then once she had the baby in March, she decided to move to go live with her family, her parents in Bellingham, Washington. And so she decided to leave Kenneth. Kenneth tried to keep her here, but she basically said, no, the only way that you can keep me is if you join me in Washington. And so that's what he did. He joined her in Washington and that's where he ends up getting caught. So it was the week of Thanksgiving that um, the Hillside Strangler or Stranglers were their most busy because they ended up um, amassing five victims and leaving their bodies um, scattered around Northeast Los Angeles. But this one happened after that. This was unfortunately a, a girl named Kimberly Diane Martin and this was uh, in the middle of December. So they would still perpetuate more murders after this. Now when Kenneth called the Climax Agency to book Kimberly Diane Martin, he requested a tall blonde with a black underwear. And when he called, the people that were taking the reservation heard um, noise in the background and asked him for a phone number because they were a little curious. They needed an apartment number. And he gave them um, a payphone number and said that he was actually calling from the payphone lobby in this apartment because he didn't want the switchboard operator to um, connect it to his apartment where his wife was. He was gonna be meeting this woman in a different place. Kind of a crazy add-on and he apparently was hiring her for $150. So where he actually made the phone call from was the payphone in the Hollywood uh, Public Library on Ivar. And when they went and interviewed people there, they said that there was a woman that worked there that said that there was a, an Italian guy who was following her around through the aisles of books. So since the woman was sent here, the police came here and interviewed tenants and no one saw or heard anything except for one person, Kenneth. They said he was a very enthusiastic and eager to talk uh, witness who said that he had heard a bunch of noise but thought that it was a domestic dispute so he didn't get involved and he didn't call the police and that was pretty much all they had to go on. Now the police said that during this time they had all kinds of clues coming in and a lot of them from people who claim to be fortune tellers or um, have some sort of talent like that and they said one guy actually flew from Germany to come meet with the police to tell them that he had a vision that two Italian brothers were committing these crimes. He was pretty close. And one of the other scary ways that they said that they would inflict pain on these women as they were killing them is that they would inject some of them with household cleaning fluids. Now during the trial, Kenneth formulated a defense of saying that he was mentally insane and um, would give all these reasons why and then eventually would be found to be lying and was sentenced to six life sentences. He's still in prison. Angelo, however, did die in prison of cancer. Now as I read more and more into this, I was a little confused as to like how Kenneth could have moved in and the police wouldn't have suspected him or anything. And it was because he actually did the uh, killings in another vacant apartment in the building, not in his own. There were actually, um, they said, three other vacant apartments. But when they investigated those apartments, none of those had any kind of markings or anything like someone trying to break out or anything on the door or anything, no evidence or anything like that. He had cleaned it all up. So when they came to question people, his apartment had things in it and everything he had just moved in. Look at you. Look how excited you are. Are you excited? Ah! <laughs> ja, they always love to see you. You know that. You're the highlight of the channel most times. Well, Kenneth Bianchi remains serving out his prison term, life in prison. But in 1989, after a three-year pen pal courtship, he did end up getting married. He got married over the phone in a 15-minute ceremony inside the prison chapel and uh, 
his wife and he are still together and apparently before she met him she used to write Ted Bundy so there you go guess everyone finds love in the end thank you everyone for watching we'll see you all next time have a great night and good Bye.